Ah, it's wonderful to be here. I got to actually be here last week with Easter. It was What a great celebration. Loved the music that Kanji did. Just love the music here. And then just the message that Ricky brought was so, it was powerful and fun and celebratory. And you remember that the essence of Easter is hope, he talked about. And the hope is that God came to us to be with us, to save us. And that message is life-changing. The story of the first Easter, I mean, the empty tomb, it changed the life of the disciples, and it changed our lives. And one of the things that we want to see is we want to see that message change the whole Coachella Valley, right? We do. And part of that means that we've got to take that message in a powerful way. And so today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, give to you, what Christians for 2,000 years have focused on as the way that we take God's message to the world. Is that exciting? Oh my gosh, I have the excitement. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna do that by looking at the book of Jude. Now, one of the things that's interesting, for me, I was a pastor at Mariners for about 35 years, and there came a point where God clearly led, Lori and I said, it's time to make a change. Part of that for Lori, we have 11 grandkids, and so Lori was saying, it's time that we spend a little bit more time aimed at those grandkids in the next generation, and she said, you can do it with me or I'm going without you, but that's what we're going to do. But the other thing is, is that for myself, it came to a place where I really wanted to invest in the next generation of pastors, so I spend my time mentoring and coaching senior pastors, and I thought that what I'd be doing is that I'd get to go and uh, help pastors understand the genius and the beauty of the church. And what surprised me is most of the calls that I get are because churches are falling apart and people are fighting each other. You might find this difficult, but people in churches don't always get along. And I'm like a crisis counselor. So I thought, no, I'm gonna talk about God's grace and here I am talking about a problem. That's exactly what you're gonna read when we look at the book of Jude. Jude's the smallest book in the Bible. It doesn't have chapters, it just has verses. It's one page in your Bible. So we're gonna read it, and I'm gonna read to you what theologians say are the central idea of the whole book of Jude. So here it is, look at what uh, Jude writes. He says, dear friends, I have been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share. So he wants to talk about God's grace. It's be so good, but that's not what he gets to do. He says, but now I find that I must write about something else, urging you, now here's the key phrase for the whole book, to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. That is the word of the Lord. Now, we're gonna look at this passage and to understand it, because what happens here is Jude is writing to the churches in the first century. Now, do you know who Jude is? Who is Jude's mother, all you Bible scholars? Mary. Mary. Oh my gosh, she's a genius. Mary. That means that Jesus, that Jude's brother, half-brother was Jesus. And his other brother that you would know was Jan- Oh my gosh, they didn't get that at the nine o'clock. You're clearly the brighter group. <clears throat> so so Jan- Jude is writing here. Imagine what it was like. I mean, Jude, it, it took him a while to believe in Jesus because who wants to have a perfect older brother? I mean, there's a story right there. But Jude, after the resurrection, believes in Jesus, and now he's a follower of Jesus, and he writes this book, and in this book, he says the problem, you know, is that the church has been infiltrated by influencers, people who thought that they knew what God's word says, and they were happy to tell people what God's word. And these people, he identifies them, says they're ungodly, deceitful, they're immoral, and they're condemned. That's who they are. And so then look at their message. Verse four captures the message that they wrote. Their message, verse four, is some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches saying 
God's marvelous grace, so they've twisted God's grace, so I'm gonna teach you about God's grace, allows us to live immoral lives. So there's two parts to it. So first I'm gonna do is I'm going to, now I'm gonna tell you, heads up, I'm gonna tell you about God's grace. There's a quiz, okay? And I'm gonna try to trick you, okay? So you ready? So you, gotta, you can't just start punching out anything because I'm, I'm gonna try to trick you. Let's see how smart you are. You need to be better than the nine o'clock, okay? So, <clears throat> so here is the story of God's grace. And at the end, I'm gonna try to trick you and twist it just like they did in the first century. The Bible tells us the story that when God created the world, everything was right and good. We lived in loving relationship with God, each other, and ourselves. And everything was right. But we didn't like it that way. We didn't like it the way that God created it. We wanted life on our own terms. God warned us if we did that, it would ruin everything, but we did it anyway. And so when we did it, it destroyed our relationship with God, with each other, and even ourselves. And the result of us walking away from God is the broken world we live in today. Wars, oppression, disease, jealousy, hatred, Racism, sexism, all of the evil of the world is because we walked away from God. But God loved us too much to leave us that way. Grace. And so 2,000 years ago, God came to this earth in the person of Jesus Christ. Grace. And he knew the only way to save us was to allow the sin that was destroying us to infect him and he went to the cross and he died the death that we are already dying to give us a life that we could never ever have on our own, grace. He didn't give us what we deserve. He gives us what we could never earn, grace. He gives us forgiveness. He makes us righteous. And not only that, because of his death on the cross, he gives us the power to become the people that we want to be. So he gives us the Holy Spirit and he gives us God's people, a church, a family to grow in grace. And so because of grace after grace, as followers of Jesus, we don't have to worry about sin anymore, right? Do you know? Do you have to worry about sin anymore? Let me give you a verse and try again. That's not even the trap, okay? The, <laughs> Romans 8.1 says, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you are in Christ Jesus, do you have to worry about sin? No, you don't because you are forgiven. Shame and guilt is taken away. When you sin, does it show the beauty of God's grace? Yeah, come on, does it show you the beauty of God's grace? Come out there, be wrong or right, let's go. Does it show you the beauty of God's grace? Yes. Does God love to forgive? Yes. Are you free to sin? Yes. No, see, there was a twist, I got you right there. See, but got you the moment, the twist. You're not free to sin, you are free from sin, very important. And so the reason is because we used to be slaves to sin, but now that we follow Jesus, we are free from sin. Look at what it says in Romans 6, 1. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? No, that's right, of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Sin was our master, but Jesus came, died, destroyed sin, so we are free not to sin. We are free from sin. And besides that, while God forgives sin, sin always hurts. The consequences of sin remain. And so you don't want to sin because it hurts you, it hurts the people that you love, it hurts the city that you live in, it hurts the world. It hurts, so you don't want to sin. But do you see how they twisted God's grace? Look at it, you're free. You've been free to sin. God loves to sin. God loves to forgive sin. When you sin, it's okay. Boys will be boys. You're, it's all right. And if you go a little too far, because God loves to forgive. And then specifically, the twist is we're free to live immoral lives. And so what they said is, you know what? Your desires are a destiny. If you have certain desires, it's okay. You can do whatever you want because God is a forgiving God. He understands and so we're free to sin. So, you know, if you go too far, it's okay because you have desires. God intended you to do that if you have a desire. Do you believe that? There are a lot of desires that we expect you to manage. And I expect, and you expect of yourself to manage. For instance, 
I, this morning, I came in, and when I came in, there was this beautiful car that was, it's kind of a classic. I don't know if it's antique, but it's a, it's a classic car, and I desire that car. Is that car my destiny? No, that car belongs to somebody else. But if you say, you know what? No, it's my desire. I should have whatever I want. I'm just going to take that car. Is that right? No, (laughs) desires are not destiny. Some of us get hurt. And when we get hurt, you know, we get angry. And then anger leads to resentment and revenge. If I have a desire to, to act out in vengeance and not forgive, is that desire a destiny? No, I have to manage that desire. I have to live with that desire unfulfilled. I don't get just act out. I had a, there was a guy I met. He actually was trying to persuade his wife. He said, look it, I have a desire for multiple partners. I'm just unusual that way. And so, you know, he's just expecting his wife. Is that desire a destiny? No, desires are not destinies, but that's what people were saying. And especially when it came to sexual immorality. And who, you're going to be talking about that in the Cultivate series. But the Bible is very clear. God, it says in Genesis, and then Jesus repeats in Matthew 16, God created them male and female. He created them. For what purpose? God created masculinity and femininity. Why? So that a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. What's the purpose of sexuality? that a man and a woman become one in marriage. And so the confines for sexuality is really defined for marriage. And then Jesus said, what God's brought together, let no one separate. So there should always be fidelity and purity. And so any desire for sexual immorality outside of those boundaries are outside of God's will. But people were saying, no, no. God loves to forgive. God's gracious. You have a desire. You get to do what you want. And they just became permissive. And they're saying, no, that's not true. The whole point is it's critical to have right belief. And they had wrong belief. And Jude's saying, no, no, here's the truth. And then the worst part, then look at what it says in 1 Peter. He says, you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your own ways of living to satisfy your own desires. And then they denied the authority of Jesus, that Jesus wasn't Lord and Master. Think of the difference between Jude and Judas. What's the difference between them? Judas says Jesus is Lord and Master. There's the answer. See if you can get it. Jude Jude says Jesus is Lord and Master. We'll try it one more time. I'm giving you the answer right now. Lord and Master, okay? Jude says Jesus is... Judas said, Jesus is, no, you're not paying attention, Judas. In the upper room, when he was with the disciples, Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. And every disciple said, Lord, not I, Lord, I would never do that. Lord, the one who has the right to rule my life, master, not I. But Judas said, not I, No Bible scholars, you got it all right. Where are you? Come on. Here, pay attention. What's the right answer? He said, oh, you don't have it. Rabbi. So what did Judas see Jesus as? A great teacher, but not Lord and Savior. And one of the things that's fundamental is that anybody who doesn't say Jesus is Lord and Master, you don't want to listen to him. And that's what Jude is saying. He's saying they are wrong. And their future, look at what it says, they've denied our Holy Master and Lord Christ Jesus. And so their future is that they're destined for judgment. And then look at what it says in 2 Peter 3, 3. This is the danger. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come, mockers, and the truth, and they'll follow their own desires. So, what are we to do? Look at what we are to do. In verse 3, we are to defend the faith. Here's the key idea of the book of Jude. Defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. Defend is a very powerful word. It's an athletic term. It's where we get our English word agonize. We are to agonize for the faith. What is the faith? It is the words of Jesus. It's the words of the apostles. It is the words of the prophets. It's found in 
The Bible, you're so brilliant. Look at how'd you get that? So it's found in the Bible. And he says, you are to contend for the faith, which was given once for all time. So God gave us his word. It is complete. It is pure. Nothing needs to be added to it. Watch, a holy God has given his holy word to his holy people. That would be you. And so now it's your turn. Everything that the Coachella Valley needs for men to become great and loving husbands, to be great fathers, for women to become loving wives and great mothers, to become great friends, to be great workers, to be the people that God wants you to be, all contained in God's word. And now he's given it to you. Oh my gosh. And so it is your job to defend the faith. So what does it look like? To defend the faith for 2,000 years, the Christians have taught that the essence of defending the faith is good. You got one of the three. So love. So to defend the faith, okay, Peter talks about it in the books he writes. Paul talks about it. John talks about it. And he talks about it. Jude talks about it right here. There are three things that for 2,000 years Christians have taught this is the essence of defending the faith. During the Super Bowl, you watched football coaches be interviewed. Every one of them said the same thing. To win the Super Bowl, you have to win all three phases of the game. You have to win on offense. You got to win on, and you got to win on special teams. And you know more about football than your Bible right now. Okay, so the three things that you've got to win are love, Jesus Christ. Here they are. Right belief right behavior, and a loving lifestyle. You got them? See if you can punch them out. There's the answer. I'll give it to you one more time because I know it's just so hard in the late afternoon. Right belief, right behavior, and a loving lifestyle. For 2,000 years, Christians have taught that the way that we proclaim God's word, the truth, and we carry it to the world is through right, right, and a loving lifestyle. Least you mumbled, you didn't even try. Okay, so let's look at these three things so they come alive, and then I want to tell you a couple stories so that you get how powerful it is, because we want to take the message of the resurrection to the valley, and it is critical that we understand, and first, it's right belief. You have to have the faith. You have to understand what God said, but having right belief is very hard, very hard, and I'll tell you why. We have a problem when it comes to belief. Scientists and researchers have found that we have a hard time changing our beliefs because we have a thing that they have called confirmation bias or belief bias. And what they mean by that is this. We undervalue evidence that contradicts our beliefs. We overvalue evidence that confirms our beliefs And it seems that we are hardwired to feel good about not changing our minds. Now think about that, okay? Because, so, we have a confirmation bias, belief bias. We, you know, anybody who agrees with us, we really value that. Anybody who disagrees with us, they're idiots. And we like standing our ground. And here's the problem. What's the problem everyone has in this room? You're wrong a lot. Okay, watch how fun this is. Just turn to your neighbor and look at him and say, you know, you're wrong a lot. Watch how fun this is. Okay, now think of that. Here we are, and we're people who don't like changing what our beliefs are, and we're wrong a lot. And the problem is, is we get defensive when someone disagrees with us. And the reason that we get defensive isn't because we're right and they're wrong, or we're wrong and they're right, We get defensive just because they disagree with us. And here's the problem. If you were talking to a, you know, to somebody that you loved or you were coaching somebody and you said, you know what success to life, oh, I'm getting really excited. Are you, calm down here. If you got, you know what success to life is based on? Success in life is based on your ability to learn and grow and change your mind. And you know what success in the Christian life is based on? Your ability to Learn and grow and change your mind. And we are hardwired to not change our mind. So what do we do? 
aren't you glad you're in church? (laughs) Because I'm going to read this next verse to you, and here's what's amazing. This is a reason you should want to be a follower of Jesus. You should want your friends that are pig-headed to be followers of Jesus, the people that you love, because just look at the greatness of just this verse and what it says about God. Don't copy the behaviors, Romans 12, 2, and copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. What you can't do, God does. He comes into your life and he changes the way that you think. Oh my, I know. So what is God's part is that he's changing our mind. What's our part? What could we do to join God in what he's doing? Oh my gosh, how'd you know? Read the Bible, okay? Because as we read God's word, God's spirit uses it to frame and to change our thinking. We are the youngest thinking people in the whole valley. I know what you look like. You look as old as dirt. But the truth is, you, we are the youngest people. Why? Because we have God's spirit in us. We, we, we read God's word and our minds are young and we are learning and growing. And that's it. You come to church and you hear these fascinating, brilliant, insightful messages given by Ricky. And so that does it. Not only that, you can go to Rooted and you learn about God's word and who God's is, or you can go to Cultivate and all these things. So you have all these opportunities to learn. But it isn't just knowing something because the Bible uses two words for know. One word is to know about The other is to know, meaning to experience it as true. The Bible almost uses exclusive, gnosko, to know something, to experience it as true. A classic book that's written years ago by J.I. Packard is called Knowing God. And almost every page, he says, God, you need to know who God is, but it isn't enough to know about God. You need to know this and experience it as true. So you need to know that God is loving and good and he's faithful and he's powerful and he's everywhere present, but it's not enough to know about God. God wants you to experience these things to be true in your own life. For instance, the way the Christian life begins is that you know It isn't enough to know that Jesus came and that he died and he's the savior of the world. That does not change anyone's life. It is only when you experience it personally and the savior becomes your personal savior. You experience freedom from shame and guilt, forgiveness, and a whole new life that begins. That's where the Christian life begins. God wants you to experience it to be true. God wants you to know that he is powerful and awesome. I mean, it's been beautiful this week in the desert, except for the couple days when it was windy. But when you get to see the mountains and the snow and you see God is majestic and powerful, he's a God of beauty and order and creativity, but it's not enough to know that about God. He wants you to experience personally that to be true. And how does that happen? Well, in the, in this broken world, When sad and terrible things happen to us, God promises to work, even though the bad things happen, he promises to work in our life and to create good, to create beauty and order and excellence and creativity. And so that when we look back on our life, we see, look at what God was doing. Everything wasn't good, but Romans 8, 28, but God is able to work even in those bad things and create good. He wants you to personally experience that. And that becomes a story that you tell in your life. God wants you to understand that he brings dead and dying things back to life, this message of the resurrection, that God is a God who heals, and he wants to heal you. He wants to heal broken relationships, broken marriages. Uh, He wants to heal broken dreams, and he doesn't want you just to know that he is a healer with resurrection power. He wants you to personally experience that, and so we cry out to God, and he heals us in that, that God is a protector. He is a provider, and when we experience these things to be true about God. It changes our belief. It changes what the way that we think. We have these young minds. 
in all bodies. And it says, and look at what he says in Ephesians 4, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown around by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. So how are you doing in the first phase of the Christian life, which is just right beliefs? How you doing? And if you're not, you say, you know what? I could improve a little bit. Well, what would that mean? Maybe go to the cultivate thing. Maybe your church attendance needs to be a little bit sharper. Maybe you need to do rooted. Maybe there's something that, you know, what would it mean for you to take your next step to join God in what he's doing, which is transforming your mind? Okay, I'm exhausted. That's it. You know, and that's all I got. We're doing. Okay, what's the second thing? First it is. Right, okay, this group, you're the turtles right now, okay? Bluebirds are right here, turtle group. You need to be a little bit quicker here. Just you. First thing is, well, oh, good for you, A students. Right beliefs, and so now it is right behavior. Here's where we have the opportunity to adorn the truth of God's word by our obedience. We follow what God says. We take the words and the melody of God's wonderful grace and kindness, and we sing that song to the world. We embody the truth of the song, and we live it out. And I know right away, some of you are going, yeah, but I'm not real good at it, and I stumble and fall, and you know what? I'm not that good of a singer, so I'm not sure I can sing the song, or my life isn't that, and you know what? It's it's just not attractive, and that's not true. That is a lie from hell, because you are God's masterpiece. And the beauty is that God is creating his beauty in your life, and all you have to be is authentic and real, and you sing the song of God's grace, and it'll be beautiful. And you know how I know? Because I watch the TV show, The Voice. I do. And if you watch the TV show, The Voice, what happens is contestants come on and they sing. And if they're good, you know, they're chosen by one of the team captains, which are Blake Shelton, Kelly Clarkson, and two other people. And so, and they form it. And what these guys, these, uh, these coaches are, is they are incredible. They know their craft. And they coach these guys as they sing, guys and gals. And here's one of the things that you can hear a coach say. And when the coach says it, you know this person's not going to make it because they're trying to give them a heads up, but America never votes for them. And here's what the coaches say. You know what? You sing that song great. In fact, your voice might even be better than mine. You hit all the right notes. You sing it beautifully, but you don't embody the song. It's not who you are. Why'd you choose that song? You're not interpret. you know, you've got to make that song come alive in you. And when an artist can't do that, America doesn't like them. And it's true for Christians too. Do you know what the beauty of God's love and kindness is? Is when you embody it in your life and you live it out and you sing the words and the melody through your life and even though you fall and you stumble and none of us do it perfectly, God makes it a masterpiece. Because do you know who your coach is? God is. Look at what it says. This, uh, uh, your coach is Jesus, right? I jumped to here. Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This means that anyone that who, uh, who belongs to Christ has become a new person the old life is gone. A new life has begun. And then in Philippians 2.13, look at what it says. For God, he's your coach, is working in you first to give you the desire and then to give you the power. So your song is beautiful. And do you know where I see this and experience this the most? Is when you're in a small group. We're in a life group. I mean, that's why God's given us the church, because when you're in a life group, you get to see people take a truth and they try to live it out. I'm in a group with guys, and this one guy, this is the year that he's saying, I really want, I want to be a loving husband. And you know what? He's terrible. He just is. He's an idiot on all categories. He's selfish, and he's self-centered. It's just us. We can talk. And so, <clears throat> but you know what? If you were in the group, his song is beautiful. Because while he is selfish, and he is self-centered, Every time when we meet, he is so saddened by his selfishness. 
He is so saddened by his self-centeredness. He sees it again and he goes, I don't want to be that. I want to be a loving husband. And it's beautiful. It is a beautiful song and it is compelling. So how are you doing when it comes to right behavior? It's not moralistic. It's not trying to be perfect. It's just singing the words and the melody that God has given us through your life. You adorn God's word through obedience, even though we fall and fail, but we are authentic and we are real and it is beautiful to the world and America will vote for you. They will. <laughs> they just do. So how are you doing in that? And then the third thing is what? Okay, we've, these two groups have done. You've been a little quiet. First it is love, right, belief. Second it is behavior. And third it is love. Look at that. See, so smart. You tried to sit over there, but now you got a loving lifestyle. Jesus said, by this, everyone will know that you're a follower of mine, that you love one another. Look at what it says in 1 John 4. This verse always amazes me. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and he sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, and you know what, even though I know what it's gonna say, every time I read it, I feel like I just expect God to rewrite it and say, dear friends, since God loved you this much, you should love God. You should love God. That's just the way it makes sense, but that's not what it says. It says, surely we ought to love each other. The defining quality of somebody whose life has been changed by God is that they love others. And the whole theme in the New Testament is we love each other. We are devoted to each other. We honor one another. We don't judge one another, but we accept one another. We're patient with one another. We are kind to one another. We are compassionate to one another. We forgive one another. We are one with one another. We do not let things of this world separate us. We don't let political parties separate us. We don't let social economic levels separate us. We don't let ethnicities separate us. We don't let anything things separate us because we are God's loving family. And Jesus, in the, in the very last prayer he prayed on earth, he said, Father, make them one as you and I are one. And, it, and the reason he did, he says, because if, the, if we could just get it together and be one the way that God wants us one, Jesus said, the world would know that God loves them and the world would know that Jesus came to be their savior. And I have a group of guys that are far from Jesus that I keep sharing with them and there's only two things that I want them to know, that God loves them and Jesus is their savior. And the only way they're gonna know is that when we love each other. So, three phases. You know, for us to really live the message, for 2,000 years, this is what Christians have said, it's got to have right belief, right behavior, and a loving lifestyle. And it's not hard to do any one of them, but only one of them is incredibly ugly. If you say, no, it's just right belief, you know, then you get real literal and you get real black and white, you get real judgy, and it's about saying it the right way and nobody likes you <laughs> because you just are so right and the rest of the world's so wrong. That's not, that's not, the, that's not, that isn't, the way Christianity moves forward. And it isn't just right behavior where you get to be real moralistic and you say, this is what's right and this is what's wrong and you act better. Remember Ricky on Easter, he talked about you're not good, you just think you're good because you're better than your neighbor. But it's that comparison, which, you know, and when I compare, uh, I sin. Oh, you didn't get that? So see, comparison, when you compare. So when I compare, I, let's see, what's comparison? When I Compare, I, there you go, good. So comparison's always wrong. And so, so you do, and, but when we have right beliefs and we have right behavior, it leads to a loving lifestyle and that's what changes the world. And that's what it means to defend the faith. That is the way Christianity has moved forward. And when you read your New Testament, you're gonna see it all the time. It's saying, you gotta think right, you gotta believe right. You've got to live right authentically and real, and you gotta be a loving person. And that way, we change Coachella Valley. We move out and we show and tell the beauty of God's grace. You remember what show and tell was? Show and tell was the first day back from the summer when 
elementary school teachers knew that all kids needed to learn to talk in front of the class, but nobody really knew how to talk in front of the class. But if you had something that you could show the class and describe, you could show it to them and then describe it to them. And that's the essence of the Christian life. God gives you all of these wonderful stories in your life of his goodness and love. And he says, if you just will show that to somebody and then tell them about what God's doing, it changes life, right? Show and tell. You got it? All right, so my, I have four sons, and my four sons were incredibly shy, and my wife understood it because she was shy, and so every first day of school, she would give them like seven pictures of what we did during the summer, and they would show and tell, and this is how it would work. You have a picture, you can tell about it. So here's us in Texas. This is where we would go. That was a cabin we stayed at, and that's them with all their cousins, and that's where they ate all their meals on the porch, and then they would jump off the docks. That's the Guadalupe River, and they would swim and play the docks all day long and then we had a rope swing and they would learn how to do flips and so this is you know a kid going out trying to flip probably not going to make it and uh and then we had a rule that if you could start the motor on the boat, you could drive it. And this was a year that, you know, they'd put two feet up on the motor and pull back. And if you could start it, you could drive it. We were that bad of parents. And so this was <laughs> the first year. And then they would go, no, go on. Then they would do, uh, we, they, this was a the year they did bows and arrows. This is my youngest son learning how to shoot a bow and arrow like you need to do. And then they would wakeboard. And so this was a year maybe they learned how to wakeboard or we played this game where they uh, fought each other on tubes. But if you've ever been to Texas, you know the best pie in the all of Texas is the Wimberley Pie Company. And we'd go to Wimberley Pie once a summer and we would have Wimberley Pie. There, show and tell. And so you know what God does? He gives you stories in your life that give you an opportunity to show. And what makes a great story? Right belief, right behavior, and a loving lifestyle. And I have four. I won't get to tell you all four, but I'm gonna tell you a couple. But this is what your life should be. And I want you to notice, it only takes me a couple minutes. It's not like I have to lock you up for a half hour to tell you a story. They'll just be real fast. First is an emotional story. It's about Bob. Bob is older than I am. He's 87 years old. Bob got cancer and it's killing him. He has pancreatic cancer and they had to take a third of his pancreas out. Then he had to have chemo and chemo was killing him. And chemo just destroyed him and chemo kept him so he couldn't come to church. He actually is a member of this church. He couldn't come to this church and it destroyed him. And I remember sitting over a cup of coffee one time and he's lonely and he's going through chemo and it is just destroying him. And he said to me, Kenton, what did I do to get cancer? Why, how did I fail God? Why did God give me cancer? Why didn't God protect me from cancer? In so many words, that was his question. And I said, Bob, God did not give you cancer. God does not give people cancer. We live in a broken world. And disease is part of the brokenness that comes rolling through our lives. And it's part of what happened when we rebelled against God. God is good and loving. You didn't fail God. And secondly, Bob, we're all terminal. Every one of us is terminal. You just might have a greater clarity on that right now. But none of us get out of here alive. And the third is this isn't all there is. You have a home in heaven. And one day, you will be healed maybe in this life and maybe in the next. But one day, you'll go home to be with your heavenly Father and grace will be the air that you breathe. And there'll be no more chemotherapy. There'll be no more hospitals. There'll be no more wars or sadness or disease. <laughs> and everything that has been taken from you in this world will be given back and you'll be home and God will restore your song. And these days I sit with Bob and Bob can't even get through the 23rd Psalm because he talks about how God is good and God is loving and he sustains him. And he says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, and he makes me, 
light. Isn't that beautiful? He just makes you lie down in green pastures. And I feel like, and he restores our soul and he leads me through, and he goes through it. And he goes, and even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't fear any evil. Even in life's most confusing moments these days, he talks about God being faithful and good and loving. That's a story. That's show and tell. I got another story. Anytime somebody will listen to me, I tell them a story about one of my grandkids, two years old. And, uh, you know, Lori, my wife, is called Nana. And all the grandkids like her the best. <laughs> Just life's not fair. But the 11th, her name's Blakely, and she's two years old, and she likes me the best. And so when we come walking in or they come walking in the house, she'll see Nana and she'll go, Nana, Nana. And she, you know, runs kind of funny like a two-year-old, Nana, Nana, Nana. And then, and then she sees me behind her and goes, I'm called Pa. And she goes, Pa, Pa, Pa. And she just amps up and it goes so big. And she jumps up in my arms and I think, God, I love this kid. And I hold her up and she pats me on the head and goes, Pa, 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 go. Go, go, and I take her on adventures. And every time I see that kid, there is a verse, a statement that Jesus made, which is this statement. He said, if you as broken parents and sin-filled parents know how to love your children, how much more does your heavenly father love you? And I have a how much more moment every time I see that kid. And anybody who will listen to me, Christian or not having a cup of coffee, just, you know, you yell at me, I cut you off. Let me tell you about my grandkid because you know what? I'm going to tell him about God's love and faithfulness because it's time for show and tell. I got some guys that are far from Jesus, but they love money and they talk about money all the time. And you know, forgiveness is a financial term. And so they get all wrapped up in money. And so I go, you know what? I got a truth to tell you. I had this giant debt and I, and it got canceled, and they get real interested. And then I tell them about what Jesus did in just a couple seconds, and they look at me, and it's like, and I go, and now I'm debt free. And they're going, oh, you just brought Jesus up again, didn't you? And I do it. Or I talk about God giving, you know, because I need wisdom, and I need guidance. Because, you know, and so I talk about it. Because if you're going to win the Super Bowl, you got to win in three phases of the game. you got to win on offense, defense, and on special teams. But if you're going to take the message of God's wonderful kindness and love to the Coachella Valley, you got to win in all three phases. you got to have right belief. you got to have right behavior, and you got to have a loving lifestyle. And with that, oh, baby, we show and tell. You get on your feet. Let's sing.
hold out your hands and receive God's blessing. Father, look at your children. They love you. Would you bless them and keep them? Would you cause your face to shine upon them and be gracious to them? Would you lift up the light of your countenance? Would you turn your attention towards them? And when they cry out, would you rescue and save? And God, would you give them your peace? We ask in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in God's grace. You have a great day. Thank you.